So let's talk about biodiversity informatics. Essentially, it's a, a, a field of science that really hasn't been around for long. Uh, a couple years ago, some friends and I published uh, this paper uh, basically just to kind of lay out what are the questions behind this field. It's funny because usually a field knows what the questions are and evolves towards answering them. So if you think about the field of phylogenetics, the question is what is evolutionary history? And the techniques have evolved from from phonetics to parsimony to likelihood to Bayesian, but all with that same objective. And in the case of biodiversity informatics, it's actually quite the reverse, which is to say you had a bunch of people doing databasing and you had a bunch of people doing information management as far as curation, and you had some people doing data analysis and you had some people doing policy. And they really didn't, until relatively recently, didn't acknowledge one another's existence. And they also didn't really know, and I would say a lot of people in the field still don't know, uh, what the questions are. You'll see in the course of this week that at least I, and I hope the, the other uh, experts who are here, will essentially speak frankly and openly. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of people in this field who don't know what the field is trying to do. So let's start off with some definitions. Uh, I just pulled this out of Wikipedia. Informatics, broad academic field encompassing human computer interaction, information science, information technology, algorithms, mathematics, and social sciences. So that's as, about as broad a definition as we could ask for doesn't really tell us very much. Uh, bioinformatics, now this is kind of interesting. Interdisciplinary field that develops and improves on methods for storing, retrieving, organizing, and analyzing biological data. That's a nice general definition. In reality, bioinformatics refers to genomic, genetic, and to some degree protein-based data. And really when we talk about data on organismal biology, bioinformatics, that term has already been grabbed up. So more recently along comes this term, biodiversity informatics, application of informatics techniques to biodiversity information for the same purposes. So you would think that we would have bioinformatics being the overarching term that has to do with all biological data. And biodiversity informatics would be a subset of that. In reality, they're kind of parallel. Bioinformatics is suborganismal and biodiversity informatics is superorganismal. So that, I think that's a, an unfortunate distinction, but, but in effect that's what we have. So let's change some of the definitions. I would say that informatics goes beyond just human-computer interactions. In fact, the museum world has been doing biodiversity informatics for centuries with very complicated card files and indexes and catalogs and things like that. Um, I already mentioned this to you, uh, that bio bioinformatics should be broadened to be the more inclusive term. And then I would also throw in that biodiversity informatics has to go one step farther and go out to how do you capture the data? How do you make the data exist in the first place? That ends up being a major challenge in this field. So there are the research areas within bioinformatics according to Wikipedia, and you can see they never get around to anything above the level of organism. But really we have, sorry, I, I, really we have this whole suite of institutions around the world that have long worked in informatics related to biology, 
um, and related to organismal biology and biological diversity. And so these are natural history museums. They're certainly not the only place that biodiversity informatics is done, but perhaps they are the original seat of biodiversity informatics. In a museum setting, this is, this is scenes from uh, my own lab. Uh, it usually begins with animals or plants. Those are frozen animals or plants because I took these photographs quickly one afternoon and didn't have time to go out and, and get some new ones. Um, all sorts of steps involved in preparing the animal or the plant into a specimen. But essentially the idea is long-term uh, preservation. If the curator and collections managers are doing their jobs, then the specimen should last forever. Um, for example, that's a bird skeleton, about halfway prepared. You can see the information management. There's a tag that says NHR 1931. You can see all of the pieces of the element of biodiversity in there. Um, eventually, this will be prepared as a very elegant skeleton packaged into a little box with a label with all the data on it. And in fact, we go so far, and this is a horrible step, we go so far as to write the final catalog number on every bone. It's a terrible process, particularly when you get around 50 and your eyes start to go to, uh, to pot. So the data get managed initially in field catalogs or, or temporary catalogs. Uh, and those look something like this. This was the best handwriting I could find. Uh, but field number and species and the collector and the habitat and the color of the legs, each organism has its own particular set of ancillary data. But it all looks something like this. That's from an expedition to Equatorial Guinea that, uh, that my group ran a few years ago. In the old days, we would then laboriously transcribe in India ink on rag paper the catalog into these big catalogs. And you can't really see it, but these catalogs are held in a bank safe. And literally, it's a safe inside the bird division of the University of Kansas. And it is supposedly, if the building burns down, the safe sinks four stories and can be retrieved. I don't believe it. That's what those old ledgers looked like. And you can imagine some poor soul sitting and writing another and another and another. We have 120,000 birds. Imagine writing out 120,000 lines in a ledger. We also keep the field notes in a very organized fashion. They get bound. Etc. Etc. So this is kind of where the field was when my career began back in the 70s and 80s. There's the safe. Nobody knows the combination. I hope it never closes. Uh, but really, the original data reside with the birds, and that's almost always the case. It's not so universal when we're talking wet collections like fish or amphibia. Here are some bird eggs. And again, you can see quite a bit of data because that's a pretty new specimen. Here's an older specimen. Actually has a lot of data also, but that's, a, that's quite an exception. There are some fluid specimens. And you can see things are quite a bit more abbreviated just because all of this has to sit in fluid for a century or two. And eventually, the specimens get organized in, in the final collection. Uh, they're sitting on acid-free paper. They're in these very inert uh, drawers and cabinets that essentially exude no acid. The, if the idea is to make these specimens permanent, then we ought to do everything possible to make them permanent. There are the cabinets. That's my office down there at the end. So here's my revised definition of biodiversity informatics. 
the application of informatics techniques to biodiversity information for improved capture, cleaning, management, improvement analysis, and interpretation. Okay? So we can kind of use that as the, the basis of what we're talking about in general. It's kind of an exciting time. Okay, lots is happening. There are a lot of people working in this field now, um, and yet there are massive, massive challenges ahead still. So there's a lot happening right now with automated data capture, essentially where it's easiest with botanical specimens because they're two-dimensional and pretty large. But here's a, an herbarium sheet, and you can see the label right here. And so this person is developing an image of the specimen and of the label. And then that label gets translated into a structured database by various means. There's more imaging. You can see this is for, for an insect. And obviously there you have the problem of size. We get to essentially a next step where we can start doing some of the tasks of museum curation digitally. One of the best examples is in Brazil with the uh, virtual herbarium of flora and fungi. And essentially what one can do is do searches, see how many records are in the database, but also um, we can see which ones have images, okay? And essentially, unless you need to get in and look at the three-dimensional structure, these images are so detailed that it's essentially like looking at the specimen. And so you can do things like, I, w I have a plant that I just collected, and I want to compare it, here's a holotype. I want to compare the thing I just collected or the thing I just observed to the holotype. Well, for Brazil, which has invested massively in its botanical um, digital herbarium, for Brazil it's possible to look at the holotype, which might be sitting in Paris or in Rio de Janeiro. You know, Adolfo and I have done projects where we had a fascinating specimen and we had to wait until we had the resources to be able to visit the Smithsonian and the American Museum, and the University of Michigan Museum, and it took us two or three years, okay? This is taking 10 or 12 seconds. Another big task, this, none of this really has much to do with this course, but I wanna give you the whole panorama. Another big task is that of georeferencing. So maybe uh, the specimen label might say uh, on the east side of Cape Town, but if we want to do essentially any of the analyses that we're going to be talking about in this course, we kind of need something quantitative. We need coordinates. And so georeferencing is that procedure of assigning the coordinates. And there are now some very, very nice uh, procedures totally digitally enabled that allow us to take text, interpret the text with some degree of intelligence, and turn the text into a hypothesis about where we're talking about on Earth. There can be different levels of supervision so that the, the human who is, who is overseeing this project who hopefully has some knowledge of the taxon, of the history of its collection, and of the geography, the human supervisor can say, hmm, well, we have this version, this version, and this version. This one's fairly precise, this one's less precise, this one's pretty vague. I'm gonna choose this one for these reasons, okay? So essentially, our human supervisor gets in there and then we end up with, with geographically referenced data. Now there's still a lot of garbage in there, so we have to go through a data cleaning phase. This is a classic, this is coming out of GBIF, and 
The only thing I want you to notice here is this big cross. Anybody know what that is? 